demonic influence. We have one of the most well-known, respected exorcists in our land, Father Chad Rippergraza, author of numerous books, and uh, including this book that I just received, Diabolic Influence, 800 pages. I've already started reading it. I'm pleased to see St. Thomas Aquinas in almost every single footnote. Uh, it's incredible, and I've had the pleasure to meet Father Chad Ripperger in person several times, and I'm always just impressed by his kindness, his sanctity, his wit, and his knowledge. And today we're going to talk to a real exorcist, and we're going to talk about diabolic influence and uh, questions surrounding that, possession, obsession, binding prayers, minor exorcisms, major exorcisms. Hopefully I have time to go through all of that. Father Chad Ripperger. How are you today? Very good. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Well, I usually begin with an Our Father in Latin, but I wanted to defer to you. If you want to do an Our Father in Latin, we can do that. Or if you have something else or a prayer for us, Father, please. Sure. What would you like? Okay. Uh, let's do the Our Father in Latin. All right. All right. Nom nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Para noster, qui es in celis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in celo et in terra. Pano nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et debite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimittimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos a malo. Amen. Virgo potens, ora pro nobis. nobis. Nome patris virus sancti. Amen. Amen. All right, well, before the show, we were talking about this cardinal who just came out and said, if it weren't for Vatican II, we'd be a small, insignificant sect. Yes, he did what, say that. What do you say to that, Father? <laughs> uh, I think I'm just going to say pretty much the same thing I said to you. Well, basically, we are a small sect at this point because of the fact that if you actually look at the number of Catholics that actually believe everything that the Church has always believed, it's relatively small. So, um, And I think that... Uh, I just think it's it's one of those things that um, they they have to provide a certain kind of defense of what's happened in the church in the last fifty years because it's obviously from the just from the book leading into Catholic uh, leading Catholic indicators there's obviously an implosion and so they're trying to, to try to deal with it so it's just a way for them to kind of I, I hate to say it I think they're just trying to make themselves feel better about the situation yeah yeah all right well. Before we get started, everybody like the video, share it on Facebook, Twitter, and if you're new, subscribe, hit the bell. All right, first off, before we start talking about diabolic influence, exorcisms, I'm surprised, Father, by the amount of people, even Catholics, who don't know what a demon is. What right. are the origins of demons and what are demons? Well, as I talk about in the book, it's basically um, demons are fallen angels. That is, uh, when they were originally created, they were created in a state of innocence. They were holy. They actually had sanctifying grace. St. Thomas even says that they infused virtues of faith, hope, and charity, um, which was necessary in relationship to um, being able to have knowledge of the Blessed Trinity and the Incarnation. And um, so St. Thomas says there's three instances. He says the first instance they're created in this perfect act of knowing. Then they make a choice. And then uh, that's the second instance, and then that choice is either to follow what God has asked of them or not, their assigned task, which is their nature. Um, and if not, then they, um, they reject him, and then St. Thomas says in the third instance they're immediately damned or they're immediately rewarded with the beatific vision. So it's a sequence of things that happens very rapidly, but basically the demons are the ones who refuse their assigned task, that is, their fallen angels. And why does God allow them, beginning with Eve, to have influence in human affairs? I think it really just boils down to, well, there's several reasons. Actually, I go into the number of different reasons, especially in relationship to possession. Why does God allow possession? Because there's a whole um, series of reasons. But I, throughout the book, I talk about why God allows it. And usually the real moral to the story is, um, A, to test us, but B, also to increase our virtue. So when we're attacked with by demons... Um, we have to kind of come up to speed. If they, if demons weren't in our lives, people would be pretty spiritually mediocre, I think, overall. And I think that's the, one of the primary reasons. But also, as we fight against the demons, the amount of uh, energy and the focus and the dedication we have to put in, the voluntariness in a certain sense, we have to put into doing the battle, actually causes our virtue to increase. We actually become more virtuous as a result of engaging with 
uh, with demons. And so I think that's the primary reason. We see this a lot of times in possession is that, um, you know, one of the reasons, I think there's a lot of reasons why um, possession cases take longer to liberate, but one of them is the fact that people simply don't have any virtue. You know, in the past, say 60, 70 years ago, if you liberated somebody, they could plug into a culture that was at least quasi-virtuous or at least, you know, you could lead a virtuous life and people would accept that and think it's actually a good thing, where now it's not that case. So people have to be able to stand on their feet, um, not just in the general culture, but even in the Catholic culture. Right. Now, speaking of Catholic culture, there's been, um, actually just the other day, some young people said, uh, Dr. Marshall, will you talk more about satanic ritual abuse and rape abuse. awareness? And I was actually very surprised as I was reading through your book, and people are asking the name of the book. It is Diabolic Influence. Like, There's no snazzy cover, though, Father. No, I because this is... I put it on a screen, is... it'd be a black box. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's... Okay, so there's two reasons for this. <laughs> this is obviously the version that's meant for um, uh, clergy and healthcare professionals. I sent you a copy because of the fact that you're, uh, um, you know, you work in the area of um, philosophy and also theology. So I figured uh, you're just the type of person that would be able to benefit from this. But uh, then what I did is I did so that's the that's the long version, and then I did a shorter version, which is Dominion. It's the lay version, which is basically the same book, except there's certain things that are removed, which we can talk a little bit about that maybe later. But I just simply removed them. So I figured that a scholar like such as yourself doesn't really care what the book looks like. They're just only worried about the content. Exactly. Exactly. So so satanic ritual abuse without going into like lurid details uh, to scandalize people. Um, right. What is it and why are we seeing it in the Catholic Church amongst uh, apostate or infiltrating false clerics, Judas priests. Um, okay, yeah, first, what is it? So satanic ritual abuse is basically the name that is given to um, the practice of rituals or certain kinds of um, uh, occult activity in relationship to usually a victim, usually their kids or, or women or, such, or the like. And so they'll actually abuse them uh, in order to uh, empower themselves in relationship to the, their, because they're using this ritual to gain power from Satan, and so they'll use this uh, to empower themselves. And so it, it can, you know, there's all sorts of different ways that this can actually um, be done. Everything from, um, you know, just basically physically and psychologically abusing children all the way up to um, sexually abusing them, which is the more common thing that you tend to see. Um, so there's and that satanic ritual abuse, it's its very often ritual abuse because it's usually an indicator that it's not, um, it's done ritualistically, that is the sexual acts or these kinds of things are done in a very specific uh, ritual. Usually it's an inversion of some type of Catholic ritual, but there is a, uh, a ritual that's actually done. And it's sometimes called, the ritual can also imply that it's kind of done over and over again in relationship to certain people. So right in the book, there's satanic ritual abuse, and then the subsequent chapter is, uh, or I think it's, sorry, uh, is disassociative identity disorder, which is also something which very often people will undergo satanic ritual abuse and then suffer disassociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder. But, um, and so they'll actually, especially in relationship to children, they want to induce this psychological state because it makes them more compliant during the rituals. But... Um, uh, among other things, but to, so, so the satanic ritual abuse is that's that's why it's done. It's tim, it's it's primarily done in order as a form of empowerment. This is one of the reasons why you're starting to see an uptick in it um, in the uh, in, in the world elite. We noticed as exorcists that the satanic ritual abuse cases that we were dealing with, at least when I first started 15 years ago. There were cases that were actually going on in the 80s. So it was in the 1980s that we saw a real uptick, a real drastic increase in the number of satanic ritual abuse cases. And that's, that statistic, I think, still kind of bears itself out, although now it's becoming um, significantly even worse. But a lot of the people involved in, in – um, and we this, this is not, not a conspiracy theory. You can read it right online. All you got to do, really, if you want to know – who's involved in the occult is just watch the opening of the tunnel that they did in Switzerland. All you got to do is watch the ceremony for that. And all these heads of states are watching this full blown um, ritual to Baphomet. So it's not, <laughs> it's not, this isn't something that's occult anymore in a certain sense. It's kind of out there and we're starting to discover these things. 
But it, once in a while, as priests too, we, we will also, as exorcists, will come across cases where um, clergy are involved in it as well. And um, part of that is just it's all about power and empowerment, ultimately. Do you recall, it was about almost two years ago now, there was that priest who was caught. He was on the altar yeah. uh, fornicating with the two satanic women who had flown in for this purpose, and they were videoing it to project it somewhere else. So Correct. here's a Catholic priest with two yes. witches, sorceresses, uh, doing some kind of sex magic on the altar of the church. I think the bishop had the altar burnt, but this is the kind mm. of thing we're talking about, right? Yeah, it is. And we his, we've noticed two patterns with priests that end up in it. The first is um, this guy was fairly young, so he was probably involved with this before he even became a priest, you know. And so more than likely, I mean, I don't know the guy's particular history, but we've noticed that there's two kinds of priests, those who are actually involved in it before. And that's actually one of the reasons they went into the priesthood is because they were able to use even the priesthood itself by – um, committing sacrilege in relationship to the sacraments. They have their own supply of hosts. They never had to steal them or anything like that, etc. cetera. Um, and to just a priest doing it is uh, such a sacrilege that uh, in their mind, it empowers them in relationship to the diabolic much more than, say, someone who's not. But we've also come across some priests who started out okay, but they usually had some kind of moral problem, usually in the area of the Sixth Commandment. And then before, by the time they get done, they get kind of sucked into the satanic uh, ritualistic side of it. And so we'll, we're seeing both of those kinds of priests that are involved in it. Uh, Cardinal McCarrick uh, molested, that I know of, at least twice in a sacral environment. Uh, one was in a sacristy in relation to Christmas. Uh, the other was James Grine in the context of penance confession. Does that right. qualify for satanic ritual abuse, that there's not a satanic ritual happening, but it's happening in the context of a sacrament? Yeah, I mean, satanic ritual abuse usually, though, implies that um, there's a specific ritual that the Satanist is going to enact at this particular moment. And I don't, you know, without knowing the details of those specific things, um, it sounds to me that because uh, that, that, that's public knowledge, right? I mean, you can just read that stuff about what, what had actually happened. Um, in those particular cases, it sounds to me more like it was a, a uh, he was more of an opportunist than anything else. Uh, at least in those particular circumstances. I don't know about the rest of the that particular aspect of his um, life. I don't have certain knowledge about any of that. But um, it, it's it's we probably wouldn't say it's satanic ritual abuse, but we would say it's diabolic in the sense that that it's so disordered that it's something that Satan would easily get involved or inspire. Yeah, yeah. From what I've heard is is. McCarrick lost his cardinal's hat because they were able to get him not just breaking the sixth commandment, but breaking it in a sacral environment. That's what, that's what mm. got him with Francis. Right. Thankfully it's sad that it takes that much to do something like that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, you know, a lot of Malachi Martin and others have talked about that at some point in the sixties, there was some sort of enthronement of Satan or diabolical right. infiltration, uh, I hint at it in my book, Infiltration, but I don't go too far on it because I don't know the details. That something happened in the Vatican where you have Freemasons, occultists, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call these people, they're definitely under the influence of Satan, enthroning Satan. Now, what does that mean? You know, you talk about people can be possessed, animals, right, can have demons in them, places, right. homes. What does it mean right. to enthrone if that's uh, true, what would that mean, what would that even mean? Well, yeah. The, so basically, to enthrone Satan in a particular location basically means it's very it's the inversion of the, like for example the enthronement of the Sacred Heart or the Immaculate Heart. And so basically, what you're doing is is you're setting him up as the ruler or king or principality or power in that particular location. And so you're doing a specific ritual which empowers him so that he can influence. Um, those in the region or in the area, basically, is essentially what it. And you yourself are taking him as your um, your ruler or guide in that in in that context. So that's the actual structure of it. And as I understand it, Satanists do this in all kinds of geographies, right? They're taking up space. Yes. yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, there, there's a couple of ways they do it. One is they do the enthronements. The other thing is they open up. Um, it's very difficult. It takes. It, it, I've only seen it happen a few times in my own coming across these things personally. It doesn't mean they're not happening more often. It's just that I've only had to deal with them twice. And that is what they call opening up a portal, which is the inversion of a Catholic church. So the Catholic church is a. Um, it's the gateway to heaven, right? And, and so it, and from there, graces flow to the region or the area. And a, a portal is the inversion of that where they do a particular kind of a ritual and it empowers the demons to influence people in the area and in the region. And so it takes a certain level of individual involved in the occult to be able to pull that off. I've known people who have tried to do it, but they've never been able to do it. But I've also known some people that were able to do it. But these were very high level people involved in the occult. Um, but anyway, getting so that that's two ways in which you can actually empower Satan in a particular location so that he can influence the people there or the circumstances, the various things that are there too. I would, if, if I were Satan, I would want to be enthroned at the Vatican. That'd be my, my front yes. row seat. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the, the, uh, that reference in Malachi Martin's books, windswept house, there's, um, you know, without getting into too much of the details and, and, and um, stuff that would be sensationalized, um, there has been, uh, more than one source that has come out and confirmed what is contained in that book. Even the bishop in South Carolina, where the ritual took place, because it was done by a form of projection, even where the ritual took place, the bishop there did research, found out it was true, and then reconsecrated the church. So there is, because um, the, the information was in the archives. Uh, and so this is one of those things that... Um, you know, again, without getting too sensationalized, I think it gives us an indicator that um, it would be naive. Let me just put it this way. It would be naive for people in the church to not think that the primary target of the Satanists wouldn't be the Vatican. I mean, they're just going to go after it to the degree that they can. Yeah, in war, you go for the capital city. Yeah, exactly. Now, I've heard not just, I mean, not, say, Father Ripperger, but other exorcists have said, Yes, something like this happened in the 60s. Would you want to comment on that or not? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think I've kind of mentioned this a little bit in some of my other public uh, discussions of it. But, and, and again, some of this stuff, we kind of know what it is. and other things we don't have absolute certitude about it, all the details, etc. But we do know that something happened in the um, early to mid 60s, uh, mid Sorry, early 60s, I just leave it that way. We know something happened in the early 60s, and it's based primarily on what other exorcists had said. So if you listen to the exorcists talking that were doing exorcisms in the 70s and 80s who had been doing them for some time, they talk about the fact that um, something happened in the life of the church in which um, the time it took to um, the time it took to uh, liberate people, went from usually once you got faculties it was a day or two sometimes a week those were pretty pretty difficult the the case was in st louis um originally starting in dc but ended up in, in outside of st louis where they processed it took 59 days was almost unheard of in that day and age but they would they would go very quickly and exorcist said that something happened because it was like a light switch it went from Things, you know, you just kick these demons out. It wasn't that much. I mean, you still had to do some work, but they got out pretty easily and it didn't take that long to all of a sudden, boom, now it took eight year, eight months to two years. Um, and so there's this shift that happened um, in, in the uh, power that the demons actually had um, was marked. And so um, there's all sorts of speculation about what would have caused that, etc., but um, some exorcists hold that it had to do with that particular uh, event, which Malachi Martin replay, um, talks about. It's obviously talked about in the context of, of a fictional work. But as I mentioned, there's been, um, and you can get them right online. So I'm not saying it's conspiracy theory. I'm not saying anything that's, that's not known publicly. It may, a lot of people may not know about it, but you can go right online and find out about the, there, there's several other sources that verify that this particular thing happened. And um, it's, uh, I have never had a chance to talk to those older guys, most of them because they're mostly dead now, but it would have been nice to be able to find out exactly the timeline did they notice a shift. Because then that would have given us some kind of confirmation or not that this was actually the, the cause of it. Yes. 
Because if I understand correctly, the power of exorcism does not come necessarily per se from the exorcist. Right. It comes from the power of Holy Mother Church. Correct. The penance, the fasting, the faith, the health right. of the ecclesia, of the one right. holy Catholic and apostolic church. So if you right. have a weak church, you have a weaker exorcism. Is that too crude or is that about accurate? No, that's actually the uh, exorcists, uh, even in Rome recently, have been talking about that and stressing the reality of the fact that when you do exorcisms, um, you're first of all, what you're doing is you're acting on behalf of the church as a public agent, as an exorcist. So the effect is actually based upon the state of the church. So that's one of the reasons. It's obviously not ex opere operato, because if it was, then they would you just do the prayer and boom, they'd be out. And so they say, and it's not ex, ex opere operantis in relationship to the priest, even though his sanctity can have some impact. Also, I talk about it in the book that um, the more um, the more experienced the exorcist is, very often the more rapidly he can get demons out. But that's not always the case in in each case. But um, so there can be an element of that. But they say it's ex opere operantis ecclesiae, which is um, um, from the church that's doing it, right? So it's basically the state of the church will have an impact on how effective, because I talk about that in, the, in, in this book, how effective the exorcisms are actually going to be. So we do know there's something in the church that seems to have re resulted in it being somewhat compromised. It still has, still has the authority from God. It still has these things. The demons still have to obey, etc., but there's something that's been somewhat compromised as a result, and, and as a result, it's taking us longer to get them out. Yeah. All right, pivoting a little bit. A lot of people ask, you know, okay, are these people just with like, they're schizophrenic? How do you know there's really a demon there? Obviously, if a person's, you know, cursing you out in ancient Greek or Latin or Hebrew, that's a pretty good <laughs> sign. Uh, maybe you could talk about demons speaking languages. You have a section on that in the book. Um, but also how, what's the process to discern, is this person, uh, having a psychological fit or is there actual personality a person, a demon present in this person? So how do you know? Um, well, there's, well, there are, I do go into, especially in the clergy version, um, and the lay people, I removed a lot of that because the section in possession, I think in the lay version was 86 pages and then in the clergy version it's 178 pages long just the section on possession and a lot of that is because i'm going into the diagnostics how do you determine one way or another what the patterns are we have what we call primary signs and secondary signs so the primary signs are those things which human beings are incapable of doing and there's essentially three of them the first is speaking languages they don't know so uh, and this is not um this is you see this from time to time um, sometimes exorcists will mistakenly think, especially when they're first starting out as an exorcist, that, well, if I speak to you in Latin and the demon, and if you're possessed and you should be able to talk to me in Latin, that's not necessarily how it works because Christ actually does restrict the demons on what languages they can use, how much they can use of it, et cetera. So um, you'll get people who are clearly possessed because there's other preternatural signs, but they, they only will speak to you in English. Um, I jokingly tell people that I actually had one demon would only speak in Latin. So whenever I would use, for example, if I, my grammar wasn't perfect, so if I used the, the data or the accusative when I should have used the ablative or something in some, you know, uh, declension or something like that, he would just act like he didn't have to pay any attention to me, right? So, um, <laughs> but uh, and I, I thought to, at one point I wanted to say to him, you know, you're a little uppity for a guy who's taking a beating. But, yeah. um, but anyway, the point being is that they're able to speak languages that they've never studied or that they do not know. Once in a while, you'll get these psychologists who come up with this theory, which was kind of vogue for a while, in vogue for a while, which was, oh, well, maybe they heard the language sometime in the past. Well, that violates the principle of sufficient reason because no human being can hear part of a language and then all of a sudden be perfectly fluent in a language. I it's wish, just, I wish. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> so that, that, when that, I'm really surprised they weren't called on the carpet just from the silliness of that, um, proposition. So speaking languages, they don't know. Um, and then the other one is, um, uh, occult knowledge. This comes in two forms. The first form is, is that they actually know, uh, um, particulars. So it's about particular knowledge about you or some events, sometimes at a distance about what's actually going on, even though they're not there, they can't see it or they've never met the person or what have you. 
Uh, that's not too common. You do see that from time to time where they actually know what's going on. Um, one case I actually worked on, the, that was actually the form of uh, the preternatural sign that we knew that this person was possessed because I gave the demon a purely mental command. I didn't say anything. I was very specific about what he had to do and how he had to obey me. And as soon as I uh, mentally gave him the command, he uh, immediately executed it exactly as I had told him to do. So, And then as time went on, we started finding all sorts of other forms of occult no uh, knowledge. The other form is people who have, um, you'll see they'll have knowledge of the sciences, both the philosophical, theological, and even empirical, but they'll have knowledge of the sciences that the person's never studied or that's beyond their capability. So uh, I had one case where this demon was making all sorts of theological distinctions that, you know, unless you're like on your my level, they are not going to know these distinctions. They just aren't going to know these unless you're extraordinarily real red in certain areas. You're just not going to know those. And yet he was just talking about them like they were everyday um, kinds of things. And this was far beyond the woman's capacity. And then the last category is kind of a catch-all category, which is those things that are beyond human capacity. So things like superhuman strength. The one that we most see the most often is what we call morphing, which they change shape. Um, and that's the one that you tend to see most of the time. Um, and these are not just, you know, people making faces. This is structural changes and things looking like, you know, people changing into uh, animals and things of that sort. Um, but it all... It, what about head spinning around? You know, I've never seen any of that kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, they do do things that are physically, they, they appear to be physically impossible, right? Like certain kinds of contortions and things like that. And you're just like, yeah, that's not, that's not human, right? Um, but uh, sometimes people, they'll say, well, if you're levitating, then that's a sign of possession. And that's not actually true. That, levitation is one of those things that um, you can have levitation if you're in a building that's possessed and the, the person's being dragged around the room or levitated in the room. So that can be a sign of the building's possessed. It can also be a sign of sanctity, which we saw with St. John Cavasso, right? It can be sign, It can also be, um, uh, but it can be a sign of possession, but it has to be go with other signs because there's other possibilities in relationship to why uh, possessed. So there's a whole variety of different things. I actually go in the priest version I go into um, 57 different versions of that. So that's the primary signs. Then we have what we call secondary signs, and those are things that are ancillary to the particular case. So it's not the primary signs, but the demons will do certain things, like externally things will ha be happening consistently. So, for example, virtually everybody who is possessed suffers from diabolical oppression where they're finances are destroyed or their relationships are a problem or the family life is just a disaster, what have you. Um, it can also be obsession, which is that psychological patterns. I also talk about how you discern between possession, psychological patterns, and say someone who's just schizophrenic because there is a distinction. There, it's a very um, – if you know what you're looking at, it's pretty clear. But if you don't, it, you're going to have a hard time discerning it. It'll just give you one example. So somebody who's possessed – unless they're perfectly possessed, they're going to go through periods of lucidity, which means the demon's going to manifest for a while and be out of control for a while, and then he's just going to stop, and then the person will go back to normal. And so when you see that switching on and switching off, um, and there's no external stimulus that's causing the thing, there's nothing, there's no indicator of why this should actually be the case, etc., that is a sign that it's diabolic. Whereas if it's psychological, it's going to be either from an organic cause, which is consistent, or it's going to be from a set of intellectual habits, which is consistent. So you're going to see stuff, and it's going to respond to external stimuli and things like that. And so that's one of the signs that you can kind of get an indicator of that, okay, this is probably more diabolic than it is psychological. Um, sometimes, too, you see this with disassociative identity disorder. That's one of the reasons I go into it. We do come across those cases and it can look like possession to the uninitiate, but if you know what the indicators actually are between the two of them, um, it's very simple to uh, – in fact, one of the last cases that I looked at for another exorcist, he had me look at the case, and I just did a, a few things and just got I, – I was probably not even there 15 minutes, and then I just kind of slowed everything down, de-escalated everything – talk to the, the exorcist afterwards, and I said, this isn't a case of possession, this is a case of DID, and then I showed them, here's the criteria, and here's why. So for the clergy, they would actually be able to get that. So there are very clear um, indicators. This is one of the reasons in the writing of the book, um, you know, before that I had wrote, written that book on the uh, introduction to psychology, introduction to the science of mental health, 
But I spent 15 years literally watching the psychological patterns, watching the diabolic patterns, what the differences were, how they were easily to discern. And so that's what's kind of integrated into the book. So we have secondary signs. And a lot of times you can just look at the secondary signs and say it's probably possession. And then you can do certain things to bring the demon to the surface. Whereas if you realize, no, this is not it, this is more psychological, then you can get people uh, help in that regard. You know, we have all these confusing questions about transgender genderism and all that. Do mm -hmm. angels have gender? You know, sometimes you see these Spanish portraits of St. Gabriel or Raphael, and they look like women. Mm. You got women complexion, women hair and all that. And then you see some depictions and they look like masculine warriors and all that. All uh, right. You have a section and I, I skimmed it, but could you talk about do 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 angels identify? <laughs> <laughs> Are they gender fluid? Yeah. yeah. What, what's what's the angelic <laughs> gender? Uh, well, technically speaking, they don't have gender because gender and gender is ordered towards reproduction. Ultimately, I mean, it's that's that structure of it. It's also has obviously there's what they call primary sexual characteristics and secondary uh, sexual characteristics um, in human beings, for example. So the primary would be the actual physiology, whereas the secondary characteristics are the psychological things that arise from that, etc. OK, so all that being said, um, Angels, because they don't reproduce in that fashion, the totality of the entire hierarchy of angels was created instantaneously at once at the very beginning before um, uh, or, you know, just slightly before, according to the fathers, before the, the rest of the material order was created. Um, so they, the totality of them was created. So they don't reproduce. And so as a result, they don't have gender in that respect. However, they do. Um, they do are normally historically in the church's tradition they were portrayed as men because of the fact that they're the angels specifically are very strong they very the, their ability to to like for example the guardian angels their ability to combat the other demons etc is something that's normally associated with masculinity because of the fact that historically it was men who went to war and things like that um also, they're, they're also sometimes portrayed as men because of the fact that their thinking patterns are more ordered towards guiding us intellectually and enlightening us rather than nurturing our bodies and things like that, which is more proper to women. So there's a distinction, even though women do that too, but there's a so the distinction in things that are normally associated with masculine characteristics. So St. Thomas says how a demon manifests so during the session when a demon manifests, as I mentioned, there's this morphing with how he manifests. St. Thomas says, indicates the characteristics of his personality. And so, um, and in my experience, um, in all the cases I've ever had, the demons always appear as men unless their goal is to try and seduce. And so that's the character, that's the, the thing that you tend to see on, across the board. It doesn't mean that feminine nature is evil. It just means that that's the characteristics that they have that's they're more aligned with our masculine side. And so they manifest more in that way. Um, and whereas with, um, whereas they, if they, if they appear as a woman, it's because they're trying to seduce somebody, which they do from time to time in relationship to men. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you mentioned in the book that every time in sacred scripture, the pronoun used for an angel that's manifesting is always he. Yes, it's always in Hebrew, in the mask. Greek, Latin, yes. the tradition, it's always a he. And I, I there's probably, a, of course, the Holy Trinity is not, is not procreative. Of course, our Lord right. assumed a human nature and a male body, so he is male. Right. But uh, I imagine the angels are he, just as God the Father identifies, to use the language, as he. Right. Um, because they are pure spirits and they're intellect without a bodily similar to God in right. an analogous That's way. Right. So just as God is he, angels are he. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I imagine, I mean, so you said the only time they manifest as female is seduced, but those would only be fallen angels. That's correct. So That's only correct. fallen angels are trans. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did I get exactly. that right? Well, and also what it does, it's very similar to the transgender situation is it's simulation. It's not true. Mm -hmm. So and so that's that's what they're doing. They're simulating um, something that's not proper to their true characteristics. Right. 
Okay, so we're talking about diabolical influence with a real exorcist, Father Chad Ripperger. And can we go through the levels of diabolic influence and possession? I mean, obviously you would have someone like the Antichrist will be the most perfectly possessed, possessed yes. person that has ever <clears throat> existed because his will will be perfectly, we assume, uh, right. aligned with the will of the satanic. But, you know, you've got that, and then there's about, I think you have six levels of Correct. influence, uh, beginning with just ordinary diabolic influence. And I think that applies to all of us, doesn't it? It does, yeah. So if you look at the, for, there's uh, one form of ordinary, and then there's five forms of extraordinary. So the ordinary form of diabolic influence is one that affects all of us. And it essentially consists in the demon's ability to introduce things into our imagination um, and affect, it, affect us emotionally. Um, I do go into that even in the book on Dominion. So, but they do have that ability to actually influence us, and that's the lowest level. Um, the next level, the next, so the next five are what they call extraordinary, and they're extraordinary in two ways. One is they're not very common, and they're above and beyond what most people are going to experience. So the first level is in Latin, it's just called dolor. Sometimes the Italians like using the word vexation. That the problem is, is with that is that the term vexation can refer to, at least in the literature historically, can refer to vexatio, can refer to any attack by the demons in any manner whatsoever. So I kind of shy away from using that to refer to this particular kind. But basically, this is the prerogative of saints. It's when they, this, they would actually, the saints would actually be attacked. So we saw this with Padre Pio or the Cure of Ars and the like. So these are the people that were actually attacked um, physically. And so that's why it's called dolor, which is the Latin word for pain. And so this is the that's the um, the name they give to that. But again, sometimes I've had people say, "Oh, I suffer from this," and then you start digging in and you find out that they're not leading lives of grace or anything. Right. So um, the, the the next one is uh, diabolic oppression. This is where they t attack people from the outside. So this is when they attack people's finances, their relationships, their job situation. Um, they can cause problems with their property destroying certain things. Um, they can even cause death of animals and things of that sort under certain circumstances. And so you'll see those uh, tending to happen. Um, and we, uh, so that's that's the one that just deals with your, it's something external to us. Then the next one is uh, diabolical obsession. That's where they attack the person's psychological faculties. They do it in the same way that they do ordinary temptation, except it's much more intense, it's much stronger. The person usually doesn't have the ability to kind of reason their way out of it or look at it from a different point of view, which is what distinguishes it from temptation. Because temptation, if we stand back and look at it like this is ridiculous and get our mind off of it, we can do that. Whereas with people who suffer with diabolical obsession, they can't seem to think outside the box. In fact, we usually tell people, well, look, if you're being diabolically um, obsessed, don't try and get clarity in that moment. It's not going to come because the demon has control of your imagination. And all he's going to do is do running commentary. So it doesn't matter what you what you think. He's just going to keep constantly switching it to what, what he wants. So you have to attack him and deal with him, and then he'll let up, and then you'll do it. Diabolic obsession is an oppression or drastically on the rise in our culture, primarily. Uh, oppression, we're starting to see an increase because of the increase in satanic activity and um, witchcraft. Um, obsession, our primary way in which we're seeing an uptick in that is uh, pornography and um, uh, just lack of moral formation and people just leading their life according to their emotions. Possession is uh, the next one, and that's where the demons actually take possession of a part of the body unless they're perfectly possessed and it's the whole of the body. They take possession of part of the body. Um, full possession, the person, you can't tell them. You can't tell that the person's very often possessed, except by what we call the second part, some of the secondary signs. Um, and the reason being is because is the demon mimics the person's personality so perfectly, it's hard to tell that you're actually talking to somebody who's possessed or not. And the way you know is because of the secondary signs, which is things like malice, duplicity, constantly lying. Everything they do causes damage and destruction, etc. So those are the secondary signs that you would actually see in relationship to that. Um, uh, whereas most people are what we call partially possessed, and that basically means that the demons own part, possess part of it, but it also means that the, the demons are only manifesting certain parts of the time, which they call periods of crisis, and then they go through periods of lucidity where the person's normal. So if you look at 
the case of the exorcism of Emily Rose. If you actually look at the books, don't don't read the best book out right now, even though I'm still not completely satisfied because I want to know more about her ultimately because I have a devotion to her is um, Annalise Michelle, who's actually the book, the exorcism of Emily Rose is actually based on. She went through periods of lucidity and crisis. So during the periods of lucidity, she would spend hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament praying for the clergy at the time because this was in the late 60s, early 70s when they were just going off the rails. Um, and she she was very sensitive to that, and so she actually offered up her possession for that purpose, um, for the for the clergy, for the conversion of the clergy, so they can go through periods of lucidity. Then the last one is subjugation. That's where people make a pact with the devil. But as I talk about in detail in the book, what is a pact? Because most priests today do not have a philosophical understanding of what a pact actually is. But once you understand what a pact is, you realize that technically speaking, a demon cannot enter into a pact or contract because there are certain requirements that he can't fulfill or meet. But they can convince us that we're under this contract, that we've entered into this pact to keep us subjugated to them. Um, and so people who become perfect possessed are always subjugated because they've made a pact at some level with the, with the demons. But not everybody who's made a pact is necessarily perfectly possessed or even possessed. I've come across some people that made a pact, and by the grace of God, he kept them immune from possession. Okay, so the levels are ordinary diabolic influence. Is that the basic that's, level? That's the, yeah, which we all are subject yeah, to. Yeah, that's just, you know, the, maybe it could be your internal concupiscence. That's not diabolic, but it could be, you right. know, just this voice saying, you know, just to do something absolutely absurd that you would right. normally not be tempted. And it's just like, right. where is this coming from? Okay, so right. that's what that is. And right. what's the best way for us to resist that? Prayer, sign of the cross, how do we just snuff out uh, that voice? Yeah, all of, uh, there's two parts. One is regular receiving of the sacraments on a regular basis is the primary thing and staying in the state of grace. But then also, if you're being tempted in a particular area, that's an indicator that God wants you to work in virtue. So performing the acts of virtue contrary to those particular forms of temptation. Certain forms of temptation is just a matter of custody of the mind. Getting your mind off it. Don't stop thinking of it. Don't try and figure it out. Don't just get your mind off it. Get it on something else that is good, wholesome, or at least indifferent morally. And so you just, you know, because, um, and so you, that's, you're basically just what you would do with any form of fighting any kinds of temptation, which I think if I remember right in the book on Dominions, <laughs> even though I spent three years writing the thing, when you write something that long, which I'm sure you can appreciate, when you write something that big, you start to forget what you wrote in the beginning. So, but, uh, but anyway, the, I do go into how to combat that in the book. Good. Okay. So then the next level is the dolor or the external pain. Is that right? That's right. Okay. And then oppression oppression and then obsession right and can you again explain the distinction on oppression and obsession maybe with a couple of examples in a yeah, person's so, life yeah so oppression would be where they're attacking one's externals like one's income or finances so um and how do you know that the person just you know is doing a bad job at work and got fired i mean what what's this I mean, oh yeah. this is just I mean, like complete total ruin or what, what are we talking about well, we're looking, okay, what we're looking at is for two things. One is no antecedent cause on the person who's suffering it. And then the second part is patterns. So when it's diabolic upset, oppression, it will almost always be in a very specific area of their life. You know, like, for example, um, they'll, the, they'll just constantly destroy the person's property. Um, mm -hmm. oh, let me give you an example. So there was a, um, a very devout couple, very good people, um, friends of mine who um, they were being oppressed. And um, one of the uh, indicators of possession is they own a farm. And um, in the course of one year, uh, we actually did find out what the source of the problem was. It was a Freemason who lived across the street who was doing certain things. But uh, in the course of a year, they lost, lost 58 animals to death on that. And they would literally walk out on the porch and then all of a sudden their dogs being choked to death. Right. That's a pretty kind of an extreme example. Another example that you'll see is finances. So um, the uh, one of the cases I dealt with in the past of a woman was possessed, he would he would just shut down her income. We would say a set of prayers, get him beat up in that area. Then all of a sudden, boom, out of nowhere, her, her income would just start coming in. And then if we stopped saying the prayers, boom, it would just shut down. And it was literally on cue. Right. So 
um, that was one of the one of the signs or the indicators. So it's um, you're, that. So those are the kind of things that you're looking for. With ob- obsession, however, it's an attack on the internals. So obsession is external to the person. Well, it can also be their health. An example of um, I give this one somewhat commonly. So when I was um, shortly after I was an exorcist, maybe a year or two after I was an exorcist, I was in Memphis, and they brought me to this guy that was in stage four pancreatic cancer. And they said, would you pray over him? I'm like, well, I don't have the gift of healing, so but I'll pray over the guy. you know. So I figured, well, I'll just do chapter three, which that's our name for Leo XIII's uh, Exorcism of Apostate Angels. Um, so I just did chapter three over him. And uh, he said he felt better. A week later, he was cancer-free. Then wow. a year later, they bring him. He had some other weird thing. I prayed over it, and a week later, boom, it's gone. And I said to him, I said, you're under some kind of a curse. You need to track that down and find out what it is so she can stop this particular pattern. But the fact that demons can cause physical health issues um, is I actually got cursed once by a woman who I had did an initial interview. And I told her, well, unless you're willing to cut bait with the demons, I can't really help you. And when I left, I got the worst case of gout I ever had my entire life. I mean, it was (laughs) and. Um, I, I was actually the priest um, that one of the priests that had trained me had sent her to me to help because he couldn't do it. And so I, um, a week later, this gout wasn't going away. Usually if I just cut out dairy, boom, it'd be gone. And I didn't really have it that bad to begin with. But then this was a really bad case. A week later, nothing's happening. I even took those pills that are supposed to get the uh, uric acid out of your body and all that. Nothing happened. So I realized, I wonder if she cursed me. And so I did that exorcism of Leo XIII over myself, and within an hour it was gone. Wow. So that tells you. And so I called the exorcist that had sent it to me, didn't hear from him for two weeks, and I started getting worried about it. He calls back says, oh, you know, I would have called you, but I had the worst case of gout I've ever had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, you are cursed. And he said, because I asked him, do you still have it? He says, yeah, I still have it. I said, is it in your right toe? Is it in the big toe in your right foot? And he says, yeah. I said, that's where mine was. So he did the he wow. did the minor exorcism. Within an hour, it was gone. So she so, cursed both of you priests. She did, yeah. The same malady. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so, so, so that's... Uh, oppression. Oppression. Okay, so now we get to obsession. So that's attack of the psychological faculties. It's primarily internal. And so these are people who just... That we would say that they're OCD, um, but the difference between that and the psychological side, and this is something, I'll, gi- I'll, I'll give an example of this, especially for the priest. This is a pattern that priests will often see. Somebody will come to confession, and they'll confess a sin. Usually it's in the area of the Sixth Commandment. So they'll confess a sin, and then you give them absolution. And Father, and let me interrupt, because there's people in sure. the live chat that are confused on the Sixth Commandment. It's adultery. Adultery, Sexual yeah. sins. That's correct. Okay. So... What they do is they um, they will um, come in, they'll confess the sin, you give them absolution, and they literally feel like this lifting. They feel great. This heaviness that they had is gone. They, they don't have, literally, they think it's that they've kind of conquered the thing because for two or three days, they have literally no temptations, and then all of a sudden it just sets back in and they fall. And they're not recidivists because they do intend to overcome this thing. It's just that they kind of go through this pattern of up and down. And um, the uh, so because absolution has the same kind of effect that and going to confession has the same kind of effect that exorcism does. If you pray over these people, you'll see that exact same pattern. And that's a sign that it's diabolic obsession. Whereas um, and so that's a pattern. So I tell priests, look, if you see that pattern in somebody, that they're doing everything they can, they just keep falling and they're trying the best they can, but they just can't see, then, you know, try praying over them and see if that ha- if, if they if it starts to lift. There's also that the things that they can do in order to overcome it. Whereas if it's psychological, if it's true OCD, the person, it's a set of mental habits. And so the person is just, it's it's continuous and it's constant and it doesn't really change much. If you pray over them, there's no significant shift or change in the person's symptomology. They just continue to go along. They might feel a little better because of the social interaction, but there's no real like lifting that they feel. Um, and they won't go like two or three days or more, even a week sometimes without having the difficulty. So that's one of the signs of diabolic obsession as opposed to the psychological obsession. Okay, makes sense. And then we get to possession. Yes. And that's... So- 
Yeah, so that's when the demons actually possess part of the body. Right. And, and this was something that was news to me because, uh, you know, when I first started studying these things, that I had the wrong belief that when a demon possesses someone, they're somehow attached or in or participating in the soul of the human person. And that's not the case, correct? That's correct. That's correct. They don't, they cannot act upon the soul or even the immaterial faculties of the soul, like the intellect and will directly. They can only do it indirectly so, uh, via the body. So they can, so the possession is only in relationship to the body. The, um, part of that has to do with the nature of the fall of Adam and Eve. The sin of eating the fruit was actually a physical sin, even though there were spiritual components like pride and all that that went along with it. But it's the um, but that's and so as a result, it was through sinning through their bodies that they actually ceded a limited dominion over their bodies to the demons, and that's why we're all stuck with it. Um, and so that being the case, then they can attack um, our, our psychological facts, like our imagination, which works through a bodily organ, our memory, um, and our emotions, which are also physical. So they can actually do they can affect those, but they can't. Um, affect the soul. This is one of the reasons why people can actually be in the state of grace. So a lot of times when we work with people and they're starting to climb out and to break the possession, these people become very holy. They actually have sanctifying grace in their souls, even though their body is possessed, which of course drives the demons nuts. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things in the, everybody else says uh, Emily Rose, but it's actually Annalise. What's her name? Uh, Michelle is how I pronounce Michelle. it, but it's, yeah, it's M I C H E uh, E L L E, I think yeah. it's just like Shell would see, because yeah. she had multiple demons in her body, but she, yes, seemed that she was in a state of grace. That means she the Holy was, Spirit yeah. is indwelling in her soul. That's right, and she would receive communion on a regular basis. She was going to to confession on a regular basis. Um, you know, she was obvious. I think she was much more spiritually advanced um, than a lot of times it's portrayed because of the fact that she was very, she was extraordinarily sensitive to even just venial sin uh, and things of this sort. So, um, but yeah, and they, they can, so when you have more than one possessor, they're normally speaking going to possess just one part of the body, each going to possess a different part of the body. Um, and so that's something I kind of go into in the, in the clergy book. And also um, if they possess more than, if there's more, if there's several possessors of a single uh, part of the body, then that tells you something else. Um, so there's there's different aspects to it, but yeah, they possess a, an actual part of the body. In fact, in session, you can, um, if the case protracts for any length of time, you want to be able to apply sacramentals to that part of the body, provided modesty is observed, of course. And so a lot of times, what you'll do is you'll just, I'll, I'll just hand the demon a relic of like the true cross or Padre Pio, I got part of his glove and that type of thing. And I'll just, I'll command him to put that in the name of Christ. I command you to put this on the part you're possessing and hold it there. And they'll put it there and they'll hold it there until you take it away from them. So, um, they give you, they give you a pretty good indication of what part of the body they're possessing. And then subjugation is like the pact with the devil. And there's a lot of people who misunderstand this. They think if you sell your soul to the devil, you can never get it back. That's and correct. That's, that's not true, though. No, it is not true at all. In fact, um, as I mentioned, technically speaking, demons can't enter into a contract. Right. Or they got packs. no rights. Error has they no rights. No, they got, yeah, because I go into it, there's essentially three years. A, they got no rights. B, they, um, they, uh, all the moralists always said you had to have a body in order to enter into a contract. And the reason being is because you have to have a body in order to fulfill the terms of the contract. Well, they don't have a body, so they can't fulfill the terms of the contract. Although I do tell people you can vote now without having a body because you can be dead and vote. So, but, uh, in fact, I don't know if you've seen that meme going out. They, this woman's like, look, when I die, make sure I don't vote Democrat. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, so the, but, and then the third part about it is, is that they, in order to enter into a contract, you have to be able to fulfill the terms of the contract. Well, demons can't guarantee that. There are instances where they can, they have been able to, and God permits them, such as the case of John Lennon. But then there were other times, like I've had cases where, People entered into a pact of the devil. They became possessed, and then, um, but they, the demons were not permitted by God to fulfill the terms of the contract. So that's why. And so that being the case, technically speaking, all you have to do is make a volitional choice to step out from underneath the pact and 
boom, it's no longer in effect. In fact, it only remains in effect as long as the human agent continues to will it to be in effect. If he, because that's, once he says no, well, then it's not in effect. However, I tell people, okay, so stepping out from underneath the contract is one thing, um, or the pact, because it's not a true pact, but the effects might take a while to clean up because you've let the demon into your life, and now that he's gotten into those other areas of your life, it's going to take a while to clean him up out of that. But to, as far as getting your, as far as it's not like getting your soul back, you just have to say, I, re, I renounce this pact, I have nothing to do with it, and then boom, that's it. Yep. Now, you just mentioned John Lennon. Yeah. I heard you say that before. So I did a little research, and you're right, Father. I looked into it. Um, yeah. Do you, do you want to tell the story about John Lennon and his possession? Yeah, I mean, what I've read, I, I mean, I can't guarantee because I only read it on the Internet and you know what that means. But um, but basically, John Lennon made a pact with the devil and basically the devil told him 20 years and then he was shot 20 years to the week, which I think you were the one who mentioned last time we were together. That was actually on was it December 8th, 8th right? The Feast of the Immaculate 8th. Conception. He was Conception. John Lennon was shot on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. That's right. Yeah. And, and the guy that shot him. Um, had met him actually like the couple of days before and then apparently they said he he read the guy that shot him said I don't know what happened I just literally went out of my mind and so basically it was um, I he I don't know if that guy was possessed we do have a phenomenon which we call temporary possession which I do talk about uh, in the priest's uh, version um, so it could have been a case of that but yeah I mean he was one of those cases where it was fulfilled. I did have one case where the guy, the guy was made a pact with the devil, became possessed. I said, well, what was the pact for? And he said, I've become rich and famous. And he says, well, did you become rich and famous? He's like, no. I said, well, that'll learn you, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Although I, I must admit, sometimes you see this stuff on, t on, on these movies, and it just I just die laughing. Like the, I'm sure you – I don't know if you ever watched the movie, Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou?, where the guy is like, yeah, I sold my soul to the devil. And the guy's like, you sold your soul to the devil? Yeah, I figured I wasn't using it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's That's interesting right. on that December 8th because they're, down here in Texas, there's a super popular metal band called Pantera. Mm. Pantera. And their famous guitar player uh, allegedly sold his soul to the devil. And yeah. his name was Dimebag Daryl. Anybody in the chat remember Dimebag Daryl? Anyway, he also was murdered. I believe on stage by a fan on December 8th. Yeah. Same day that John Lennon was murdered by a fan and both allegedly sold their or made a pact with the devil. Yeah. So it's kind of strange that this, you know, that both would be killed. Both makes a pact with the devil for musical talent, both get right. musical talent and then are killed by fans on December 8th, the feast of Our Lady. I mean, are demons choosing that to mock Our Lady? I don't I don't know exactly what's going on, but it's two cases with yeah. similarities in both. It would be interesting to do a study along that line of how many people have made a pact with the devil that openly, so, um, you know, and some of the people we actually know were possessed, like Jimi Hendrix would talk about how he was basically possessed on stage. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so even some of the more modern um, um, uh, artists have openly talked about that's not them on stage, right? Um, but that all being said, it'd be interesting to see um, what the packs of the devil, how many of these, um, you know, what the patterns were. Was it, you know, was it a Marian feast that they often, these packs would come to an end or, and I've no, I do know that of the ones that I have studied, their end is always very untimely or not pleasant, you know. Right. Well, especially if you sold your soul for fame, as in the case yeah. of John Lennon or Diane Bonk Darrell, and then the devil allows you to be or inspire someone of your fans. You want yeah. fame, you want to be famous, you want to have fans, and then a fan kills you. Yeah, it's the punishment, punishment fits the crime, so I mean, it's horrible. Now, yeah. also in the book, you didn't cover uh, infestation, as that's not one of the levels, that's just a different category. Oh, actually, I do, actually, I do cover the book. Uh, uh, the, I do in cover the book you do, but you didn't mention it yeah. just now. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, so the six areas that we talked about are those are that affect human beings. And then infestation okay. gotcha. is what actually affects animals or buildings um, or various forms of property. And so they can they can be infested. Uh, there's been several houses I've had to clean up. Um, there's been two buildings that I've been in where there were um, – that was literally palatable. You would actually – You'd be physically attacked by these things that were uh, in the building. Um, and so uh, 
So they can't infest buildings. Usually it's because there's been some particular evil that's occurred there. Although a lot of times people say, well, our house is infested. And then it's really not the house. About 80% of the time, it's actually somebody in the house is doing something or the demon's attached to them. And then he's just kind of showing himself externally. So you clean up the people and then the stuff in the house stops. Um, but once in a while, it is something in the house. And so you clean that up and then things just return back to normal. Um, they can also, we saw this in scripture, they can infest animals. So we saw that in relationship to pigs. Um, they can attack animals. Uh, there was one house that I had to exercise. It's actually the most difficult case, diabolic case I ever dealt with, even more so than any kind of case involving a human being. And it was a demon that was in a house. It was brutal. It was a one-year knockdown drag out to get this guy out of that house. Mm. And But the first indicator was um, the, uh, the people moved into the house and their dog immediately got sick. So I was blessing the house, but I just sprinkled the dog, and the dog yells, lets out this yelp, and then the next day it's perfectly fine. It has no health issues. And then that was one of the first indicators that there was something in the house. So we t it took us a little while to kind of sort out what this – it was a demon of illness. But uh, So they can get into houses. They can infest animals. They can infest – they can afflict animals. Um, and they can also be attached to objects. One of the things that you'll see from time to time – you can actually watch it right on YouTube – is you'll have people that say, oh, well, you know – if the demons, um, if they possess the item, they're locked in the item, and then that way you can, if you just keep the item, and then that way they can't influence other people. It's the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah, that if sounds they like a bad idea. Yeah, it, well, and that's, I, I'm thinking of uh, Ed and Warren Carroll, right? Who, um, or Carol and Warren, what is their name again? Warren is their last name. But they, they have this museum, right? And they've got this doll there that's infested and they're just like oh and they, they they tell people and i've heard other exorcists say this which is just absurd well as long as they're possessing this thing the demon's locked into it no 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 it has the it's it's, it's the inversion of a catholic sacramental it's like the uh if we bless a miraculous metal and then put it on a particular property it has a spiritual impact on the property it's the same thing with this stuff as long as they're as long as that item is intact it the demon's empowered to use it to influence people around it and so that's why the you have to destroy the object in a very specific way. And then once it's done, then the demon loses the power. So, um, but anyway, but they can in infest objects okay. as well. Uh, Father Ripperger, is yoga a portal to demonic obsession, possession? Um, it is. Uh, I, this one's always one of those. I know, I'm getting ready for the, the screeches to emerge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I want people to hear it because I don't want people to have oppression or obsession or possession in their life That's, yeah. because they're partaking yeah. in a Hindu ritual. That's exactly it. In fact, if you do, and I tell people, look, don't kill the messenger. I'm just the messenger. If you really want to research this stuff, don't go on the internet and type it. Is this a cult? Because you, you're going to get all sorts of what you have to research the masters, the yoga masters, the people that are at the top of the heap. And every single one of them will say that the positions and motion and stretching that is done in yoga, each one of them is a representation of an, a specific Eastern deity, which is a.k.a. a demon, right? Because all the gods of the Gentiles are demons. There was a guy who wrote it. I'm really kind of frustrated because he wrote the book, but he never published it. It was literally like... 40 or 50 of the top yoga positions and, they, and which deities they actually referred to based upon these masters, yoga masters. Okay. So that being said, yes, people can become diabolically influenced. I do know two women who became possessed from practicing yoga. I know people who were possessed and then by practicing yoga, they ended up with more demons. And so I just tell people you want to completely stay away from it um, uh, altogether. Yeah. Now there's this uh, new Netflix Special that people are talking about. It's in the live chat about Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm -hmm. uh, I, people probably shouldn't even watch this stuff. It's probably bad. Yeah. It's Hollywood and all that. But I mean, right. Jeffrey Dahmer is interesting. He was uh, a homosexual who was just sort of obsessed with uh, homosexuality and, and killing men and all that. I mean, have you ever right. looked into that? I mean, it seems like this guy had to be possessed by a bunch of demons. He was like collecting skulls. And he was making like an altar in his house. And it's just a weird, weird thing. Um, you know, there is there are certain psychological pathologies that can result in that. 
but but when you listen to the darkness of it and if you ta- listen to him i don't know if you ever saw that interview that he did like two, two like a week before he died before they executed him mm-hmm. he openly says the gateway is pornography and he says keep your kids away from the pornography and and at, at this point well, i think that was bundy or was that don was it bundy it's one okay. of them i thought it was bundy maybe i got it wrong but yeah he yeah, says I, one of them says Pornography is what got me. Yeah, I, I for some reason I thought Dahmer did. Maybe two, it was Dahmer. It's, it's one. Of, yeah, it's one of the two, or maybe even both of them. Probably know. But anyway, the point being is, is that it's the pornography, which means that there is uh, any mortal sin is an open door to possession, and not everybody who commits a mortal sin becomes possessed. But it's an open door, and so these guys that get involved in that, and then they start going down the path of the stuff that's more and more disordered. Um, the more disordered a thing is, the more likely is going to be the level of possession. Um, or that you're likely to become possessed. And so um, I think these guys that repeatedly get involved in that type of thing, if they're not possessed, I w- I'm just surprised. And I don't think that, I mean, you can argue that some of the psych, that this could be explained all psychologically, maybe. But I think that, that, that what caused it, the fact that it's something that's gravely dis- uh, morally disordered, um, and that it's mortally sinful, and the fact that it was something that consistent, and the darkness with which they talk about it seems to me that an indicator that there were demons involved, at least on some level. Yeah, I mean, I, I had heard, I don't know if this is right, but Dahmer was obsessed and would re-watch the film Exorcist 3, which I've never seen. I haven't even seen Exorcist 1. Um, but he was obsessed with that film, which obviously has to do with demonic and all that kind of crazy stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean the the first Exorcist movie I have seen, and and it's it's based on somewhat of a true story. There's stuff in it that is kind of silly and not accurate, and it's not how it works. But but that all being said, in fact, the first time I watched the movie The Right, I just was laughing through the whole thing because it was just so contrary to the how things function and work on every single level. Right. Um, but the, and then I did start watching The Exorcist too, and it got so stupid and silly that I never even got to three. So yeah. Um, but I think a lot of those t- those movies, I think the danger with those kinds of movies is, is that they can be purient in the sense that people are watching them because they want the psychological thriller side of it. But those, if you're not careful, those can also open certain doors if it's disordered in some fashion. Um, or just a, 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 a impure curiosity. Yes, exactly. So I, I, at least my impression was like with the movie Exorcism of Emily Rose, it's less that way. It seems to be more a bit of a story, storytelling, or it could be interpreted that way, I suppose. Um, but uh, but anyway, the the yeah, I think that that's one of the real de- things that people have to be curious, the curiosity to curiosity, which is here we're not talking about the natural human beings in um, intellectual desire to know things. We're not talking about that. We're talking about pursuing knowledge that's not proper to your state in life, right? And so that type of curiosity um, the, in these matters, you don't need to watch these things to know how diabolic work. In fact, you're not, you're not going to find it. Sometimes people will say, well, you're reading Father Rivers book on Dominion, and that's curiosity. Actually, if, if anything of the sort, as you started reading, Taylor, you know, I've stripped it of all of that. This is this is an academic exercise. This is not, you know, an, uh, a a reading through all the sensationalism and all of that. It's just not that at all. Yeah. Um, you know, we're in October. Halloween is obviously Hallow's Eve. It's the eve of a right. holy day of obligation. It's very important. Um, we're recognizing all the saints, but of course, a lot of wicked, evil things happen. What would be your pastoral advice as an exorcist to to families and people as we observe All Saints Day on November 1st, All Souls Day mm-hmm. on November 2nd, and then, you know, with with kids and neighborhoods and all that with uh, Hallow's Eve. What's your advice? Um, I, yeah, I have, a, I have a somewhat complex view of it. I know that certain people that have been involved in satanic activity have said, you have to stay away from it altogether. Well, that sounds to me like the, the guy who had a problem with alcoholism, right? right. <laughs> you know, he's like, alcohol is evil, you gotta stay away from it entirely. Well, no, you do, but the rest of us don't necessarily have to, okay. So that being said, because we can moderate it. I think in relationship to this, obviously you do not want to get involved in the occult aspects of it. It doesn't mean, for example, that your kid can't dress up as some kind of a saint, and you can't have an All Saints party or things like that. Those can actually be beneficial. You just don't want to do things that are disordered. Um, you know, you don't. Your kid doesn't want to dress up as Satan or something. You don't want that going on. Or a murderer. Because, or, 
Jason or Freddy Krueger. I mean, that's not right, wholesome. Exactly. That's that's weird. Right. And and I think that ultimately, if you do the, you know, they dress up. I think it's an important. I think it's a. I think it's a great thing that they actually dress up as some type of saint because it gets them the connection to the in the, in the feast, to the saints and the things of that sort. And so I think on that level, it's actually a good thing. You just have to make sure that what you're doing is not disordered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you know, there's there's is kind of a. Maybe it's the wrong way to say it, but a triduum of kind of All Saints Eve, All Saints, yep. and then, you know, November 2nd is All Souls Day. And, you know, we can get indulgences for the dead. So That's right. we need we need to do that. And I think it's wholesome to take our kids. We try to do it every year. At least once we take them to the cemetery. And we're right. like, why are the younger ones are like, why are we here, Dad? And we're like, there's dead people right down here below you. Like there are, <laughs> yes, there's skeletons. All, there's hundreds of skeletons all around us. And they're like, right. there is like, yeah, they're all dead. And some are in hell and some are in purgatory and some are in heaven. And the ones in purgatory need us to help them. So let's pray in our father and, and explain it yeah. to them. And then I tell them one day you're going to be here. That's right. And I, it's just maybe people, people think, think that's morbid or macabre. Yeah. I mean, I've heard people say that too, but quite frankly, I think it's, extraordinarily psychologically healthy because it's real it's it's reality and this if if you don't you know if you're not like oh they're going to get you type of nonsense but if you actually say no this is this is these people need our help like you said it, it helps people to have a connection to the to the saints and to those in purgatory which is something that is clearly lacking among the protestants among the protestants you see this they don't have that same kind of connection to the to their loved ones that have died, right? Because boom, they're gone, and that's it. There's no communication. There's no help. There's no nothing. Whereas with Catholics, it, it's quite frankly, I think it's more psychologically healthy to have that connection with them. Yeah, and I think the solution is okay. Are we going to retreat to the Satanists and let them have October thirteenth? Because it's our, it's a Catholic feast day. It's kind of like saying, well, I'm upset about the commercialism around the twenty fifth of December and the overemphasis on Santa Claus. So we're not celebrating the birth of Jesus anymore. Like that's, yeah. that's not a good perspective. That's called losing right. the culture war. What we that's should right. be doing as Catholics is defining what the day means. And Christmas is about the birth of Jesus Christ mass. And we shouldn't be running away from Halloween. We should be saying, no, it's Hallow's Eve. Well, what's a hallow? Hallow right. is a saint. Like hallowed right. be thy name. Holy. And we need to be, right teaching our neighborhood that this is a Catholic feast day and not abandoning it. If I were Protestant, I'd be like, yeah, forget Halloween. That's dumb. It's weird. Yeah. But if we're Catholic, we have to embrace the day. It's a day of obligation. Yeah. The other thing I find kind of interesting, too, is, is that the more we've um, I mean, I've been doing exorcism works for 15 years and my as lay assistant, he's been assisting for like 21 or 22 years. And, you know, the more we study this stuff, the more we find out that the high-level Satanists, the high-level Satanists, the people you don't even know who they are or what they're doing, or they, they look like the, the the person in church, or he's the judge and the or the police officer. They seem like morally upright people, even though, and the reason they appear that way and the reason you don't know is because they're doing stuff that are capital crimes, right? So they don't want you knowing this. Those high-level types of people, uh, October 31st is not their primary time. It's it's actually in the spring. And so the point being is the point being is is that um, uh, it's the middle tier people that are involved in this stuff and the hacks that are at the bottom that bake themselves known and stir this stuff up. And I think they just do that more as an allure. But the reality is is that the real serious the real serious satanic feasts are actually in the spring. So this okay. is one of the this this is one of the reasons for is it in connection with Easter or something different because it's news to me. Yeah, it's basically it's the inversion of Easter, but it's okay. usually connected to um, a particular pattern of the moon and the sun and the equinoxes and all that. So, but it's uh, but anyway, yeah. The point being is is that um, we don't need to seed it. In fact, don't and people shouldn't be afraid of it because well, this is when all the witches and Satanists are doing that. Well, yeah, the low level hacks, but this is the time which we need to re we need to reclaim this. For uh, for Catholic for for Catholicism, yeah, that's what and that's kind of what I'm, you know, I'm seeing people in the chat and they're like, "Don't do Halloween, no, no, ha celebrate a different day." I'm like, "Look, we we have to embrace November first as Hallow's Day as All Saints right. Day. Like, 
giving up the ground. I mean, and Satanists can't take over a Catholic saint state. They can try, obviously, just like, you know, if they did some sort of enthronement in the Vatican, our response as Catholics isn't abandon Rome and abandon Vatican. No, we have to take it back. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, the other part of it is, too, is, is that this also gives you an indication that people have lost a sense of Catholicism in this sense, in the sense that, you know, before Bugnini got his fingers on the calendar, you could actually look at the class of the feast and it would actually tell you liturgically what you did. So a double major was one in which you had to do vespers both on the feast and the the, the day before the feast. So it's you're, the, the, the actual feast starts with right. vespers the night before. So All Hallows Eve is technically the beginning of that feast. But people have lost that sense of it um, because of the – well, part of it has to do with the calendar, but part of it just has right. to do with people just um, don't have, a, I think, a liturgical sense in that regard. Yeah, and we have to we have to know that Satan is always going to attack that which is holy, and All Saints Day is all the right. saints. M- m- I guess we could maybe say 90, 99%, yeah, 99% of all the saints that have ever been that are in heaven right now do not have a day on the calendar, right, Father? That's right. That's exactly right. So yeah. this is the day in which most of the saints are venerated. So, of course, the demons are jealous about that. They're envy about that. that these humans who had sin are now in heaven with Jesus and Mary. They hate that. So they're going. what are they going to attack? They're going to attack Christmas. They're going to attack All Saints Day. And right. we can't give up the ground. We have to take it over. That's right. So dress up like a saint and tell all your neighbors, hey, do you know today's a saint's day? I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have, I, I'm trying to find it in some, one of my missiles, but one of my missiles has the Hallow's Eve uh, vigil mass. There's a vigil yeah. mass, pre-55. Yeah. But I can't find it right now. Yeah, which is another reason I want to go back to before 1962, but that's a discussion you and I have had over and over again. Yeah. So, yeah. So, to all the people saying, say no to Halloween, yeah, say no to the bad stuff, but Hallow's Eve, or even, uh, is a Catholic Saints Day. We have to embrace it. We have to celebrate the saints, not the demons. Right. Can you speak to binding prayers? I think this is now one of the most controversial things amongst lay mm-hmm. Catholic circles when we're at coffee hour and eating a donut after our Latin mass. A lot of people think binding prayer, lay people should not do binding prayers. So what are they and what are what's the limit or the extent of binding prayers? Okay, first let me just back up. The binding prayers was, I, in fact, the um, there's an entire section in the priest book and also in the, in the lay book on binding prayers. Part of it is, okay, so the binding of demons, first let's just back up, because some people say this is this is a Protestant idea. This is absolutely absurd. In fact, there's the binding of demons is mentioned three times in Scripture, five times in the in um, in the rituals in the, uh, sorry, five times in the rituals during the 19, or the 1600s, three times in the ritual of, Mal- of Melkline. It's mentioned even in um, the... Uh, the exorcism of, uh, I'd have to look at it, but uh, Leo the Thirteenth. So the actual binding of demons is mentioned over and over again in the history of the Catholic Church. So it's a Catholic thing. The only question really arises, which is really the question you're asking, is who can do it, right? So who can do it? Okay, so first we have to establish first a theological principle, which is prayer begets what it signifies. So what you ask for is what you're going to get. So in relationship to the, um, because Christ said, knock and it will be opened. He didn't say knock and I'll give you a car. He said, I'll knock and it'll be open. You know, asking you shall receive. So there's a correspondence between what you ask for and what it's going to do. So what your prayer signifies is what it's going to beget. Okay, so in relationship to a binding prayer, what a binding prayer is, is basically what you're doing is, is you're adding uh, and then I'll talk about the structure of how it works. So you're you're uh, you're taking some sacred thing like by the precious blood of Jesus. So you're using you're invoking the precious blood of Jesus. By the precious blood of Jesus, I bind a, the spirit of anger or what have you. And so by invoking the precious blood of Jesus, you're asking it to come down and be the the thing that causes the efficacy of the binding prayer to bind this particular demon that's causing you to be angry. Okay, so that's the structure. The, the spiritual structure and how it works. So who can do it? Um, so basically, demons are legalists, and it all revolves around the authority structure. If you have authority to do it, um, then you can actually do it. So in relationship to binding prayers, 
parents can because they have um, the natural law authority. So there's two structures of the of authority. There's the divine positive law and the natural law. The divine positive law is that bishops, priests, and deacons. So, uh, for example, bishops and priests they can do binding prayers over anybody they want. And then um, because of the fact that they're with the go to teach all nations, they have jurisdiction that extends to everybody, etc. Then there is the um, then there's the natural law structure. And so this is I talk about it in the books primarily in the context of the family. So the father can uh, the husband can do it over his wife because he has authority. He can also do it over his wife because of the fact that he has rights over her body by virtue of the uh, marital contract. The wife can do it in relationship to the husband, not because she has headship over him, but because of the rights in relationship to his body through the marital contract. The husband, the father and the mother can do it over the children because they have authority over the children. I then also talk about the fact that as exorcists, by the way, for 15 years, I've been watching the patterns. When people pray for other people against the demons, who's getting taken to the woodshed and who isn't? In other words, who's subject to the retaliation and who isn't? And if you follow the authority structure, you're not going to be affected by the retaliation, uh, generally speaking. And so what we found out is obviously if you follow that family structure, the parents just usually don't get retaliated against as long as they're leading Catholic lives and staying in the state of grace habitually, etc., but then also we found out that there's um, obligations, you know, that people have towards each other. So um, siblings have obligations of, of the fourth commandment to each other. Um, the, sibling, the children have obligations in relationship to the parents. So we've actually found that because of that obligation of the fourth commandment, which it, by extension, if you read some of the old moral manuals, they say that children eventually have may, uh, may have be responsible for providing materially or spiritually for their parents and taking care of them, et cetera. And it's because of that obligation um, that arises from the natural law in the fourth commandment, we found that if they do binding prayers in relationship to their parents, that they do not become subject to the retaliation. And so that's the structure that we've generally found. And so some people say it's an exorcism. Well, okay. It depends on how you define exorcism. If you define exorcism as solemn exorcism, which is the priest receiving faculties from the bishop in order to drive a demon out in the case of possession, it's obviously not that. The term minor exorcism historically referred to any prayer, any action done against a demon whatsoever, historically. So it was a much broader category than um, it was, than it's uh, done. That being the case, St. Alphonsus Liguri, there's numerous authors, I even talk about it in here, to saints who say that the lay people actually have a right in relationship to themselves and those they have authority over to, to command the demons to leave. And um, that basically, uh, and it's based upon, again, this, uh, the authority structure or the obligations regarding the natural law, etc. And so they actually do have, they, do ha- they can make use of those legitimately. Again, it, we, like I said, I and numerous exorcists are highly, you know, proficient in this area. You know, they're on the same level that I am. I've all noticed these patterns are exactly how I laid them out in the book. That if you follow the authority structure, you're safe. It's when you step outside of that that you're going to end up in trouble. And there's two kinds of binding prayers. There's binding prayers where you command the demon to leave. So by the power of the precious blood, I command the spirit of anger to leave, etc. But then you can, if you don't have any authority over somebody... You can petition Christ and Our Lady, Our Lady or Christ. I ask you to bind them, and then it's up to them to do it, and you're not going to get retaliated against. At least in our experience, so it it's based partly on experience, but it's also unpacked theologically and based upon the the pa- the practice of the church in the past. Okay, so I couldn't say a binding prayer over you, obviously. Uh, not well. What we call an imprecatory one, which is you commanding the demons to leave. No, because you don't have authority over me. But I could but say you, if I notice something about uh, my neighbor three doors down, I could say Jesus and Mary. If there's any demons, please deliver that person. Yeah, which I could is supplicate. A I could supplicate for that person. Now, That's if it's perfect. my wife or my children, you're saying that I do have the authority, or my house, right? Only my house, right? Not, that's right. Not my neighborhood. Correct. Unless I own it, which I don't. Right. But if yeah. I, my house, my land, whatever I have, my right. property, my car, my horse. That's correct. Yeah, your property. Yeah. I can say a binding prayer over that. That's correct. 
Now, what yeah. can you can you say an example of that out loud of what a, a father could say over his home or his wife or his child? Um, yeah. So, like for example, if it's his, let's say his name's your child's son's name is Johnny, just say. Um, by the power of the precious blood, by the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, and by my office as father, in relationship to Johnny, because your office as the father is what gives you the authority, I command the demon of disobedience to leave Johnny and go to the foot of the cross to receive his sentence. Okay, good. So That's what so I that's pray every the, night over my family. Yes, exactly. And uh, you can use the binding prayers not just when you see a problem, but as a preventative uh, measure. So this is one of the reasons why this is the, this is, it's contained in this book. If people want to get it, they can get it out of this book, that, that particular version, which I did. There's also a, a, um, a, um, what will you call it? A um, paperback version. This is the faux leather version. The people can get, get it out of there. There's other ones online, but you have to be careful because some of those, the ones that are online, some are good and some aren't. Now people are asking, what if you have, a mortgage or what if you're renting a house? Yeah, I mean, they still consider it, um, the moralists still consider a mortgage on a house is still your house, right? This actually brings up a particular moral issue, which I won't get into too much, but it's just, you know, for it, historically, if you defaulted on, on a payment, let's say you made all your payments, but the last one and you defaulted, then the, the bank can step in and turn around and sell your house and keep the money. Well, it's, that's against justice. Yeah. They have to they have to compensate you percentage wise for what yeah. you've paid on it. Yeah. But that all being said, that means it's an indicator that you do own the thing to some degree. Yeah, you're so. paying taxes on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, that's really good because I think because there are very good theologically accurate people who, when they hear the binding part, they say, "No, that's that's wrong. Um, you you can't you can't have any authority like that. Only a priest has that authority." In other words, they're they are trying to preserve the dignity and office of the priest. They are, yeah. So when they hear that and they say, well, how could a mother uh, bind a demon over her children? She's not a priest. What is this? This is heresy. But you're saying it's only in these specific places where a person has an office over another person, which is father, right. mother, husband, wife, kids, those kind of Correct. scenarios. And, and even if a child, if you're a... If you're an 80 year old person and your child is 50, you still have that authority and you can still bind, correct? That's correct. Because it's, yeah. it's still there. Yeah. Uh, I do go, actually I go into that in detail. And the, part of the reason that the chapter on authority is 80 pages long is precisely to parse out all that, that aspect of it. Part of it is to is by the time you get to that chapter, which is the fourth chapter on, on authority, I've already discussed in relationship to the angels that they have a natural law. So the demons, uh, uh, even the demons, have built into their minds the structure of the natural law, not just our natural law, but also the natural law of human beings. And that natural law grants certain rights, and the demons know they have to observe those things, unless God gives them permission otherwise. But they still, they know that, that na they're bound by the natural law, and that's why, because someone recently said, well, I don't know where you came up with this idea of the natural law. Well, it's right in the book, if you actually follow the line of reasoning. It's because of the fact that the demons are still bound by the natural law uh, in that regard, and God holds them to it. And so they know that our we have natural law rights, like you have a natural law right over joy, you have a natural law right over your children, you have a natural right over your, your uh, house, etc. And therefore, the demons have to accept that and observe that because of their own natural law built into their minds uh, and, and into their wills. So that being the case, that's why the natural law structure actually works in the sense of, and, and that's why the demons know if you do something to which you have a right over, then they have no right to come back or they have no claim to come back against you because you did something disordered. Right. Now, what people are asking, what about in relationship to grandchildren and what about in relationship to Godchildren? Okay, so uh, I do talk about that in the book. So in the uh, in relationship to Godchildren, St. Thomas says you do not have the right of command, but the right of counsel. And so basically I tell people it's uh, at least in relationship to the authority structure is pretty easy. You know, can I tell the person to come mow my lawn? <laughs> And do they are they bound to come mow my lawn right. if I tell him? So if you tell one of your sons, hey, go mow the lawn, well, he's got to go mow the lawn, right? 
That's not the case. So the, the grandchildren are not under the grandparents in that same fashion. And so you um, and as a result, grandparents have to do deprecatory or petition supplications in relationship to their grandchildren. Same with uh, um, God children, uh, adopted children. The pattern that we noticed, and it seems to be because by the natural law, God conceded the civil authorities certain authority, although they seem to be out of control these days. Um, they can, if the civil authorities under legitimate circumstances concede um, legal um, uh, guardianship to the child as, as in the form of an adopted child, then the parents can do uh, – um, they have authority over the child. They can command the demons to leave. So that's what we've noticed. Up until then, they can't. So. That makes sense to me. And then what about uh, – someone asked, can a single woman pray a binding prayer over her children? The answer is – yeah, if yeah. it's her children. Yeah. Yeah, because she still has the office of mother in relationship to them. Good. And then uh, I, I received a question just the other day. A woman said that she, her husband is living a very dissolute, uh, but, you know, life contrary to matrimony and all sorts of bad things. And she said, um, I know I can pray for him and do penance, but can I also bind? And I told her, as my understanding is, as your rights as a wife over your husband, with his body you can was i correct on that that's correct yeah, yeah she thought. can yeah so obviously this guy's dealing with some demons maybe not upset you know obsessed or possessed but right I, you know i was like i think you know i think that one relationship of the, yes right i think that uh in helping the people to have a conversion of life we've also found this effective and really two are very effective parents with the children, the parents haven't been to mass. They haven't. They've kind of fallen away from the Catholic faith. They're not really doing anything. They don't want to necessarily see a priest. Start. I tell people to keep praying for them, but they'll start saying binding prayers against any demon that's keeping them from seeing a priest. It's extraordinary how often that works. Wow. How effective. The other thing is, we also find that actually, there's three areas I tell people. The, se the second one is. If your son or daughter is dating somebody who you think is bad news, start saying binding prayers against any demons that's keeping them together. Mm. It's like clockwork. Within three to four weeks, the bad party in the relationship will leave the relationship. Wow. The other, um, uh, the, I think there was only one woman who had to do it for like three months. But then there was, um, then the other one is conversion. So if you have somebody in your family that you want to convert, you obviously have to get them the grace because they have to have the grace to convert because you have to have grace in order to, to make that act of faith. However, demons can subvert people's response to that grace by effect, afflicting them emotionally and psychologically. So say binding prayers against any, any demon that's keeping that person from coming into the church or accepting the faith. And that will also, if you keep it up, eventually it'll have its effect. Yeah. And then uh, you mentioned earlier uh, demons and then you were talking about sin patterns you would see so um you know i'm thinking maybe sexual sins or alcoholism uh would, would you counsel people to encourage that too like the demon of fornication uh, yes I, is that being specific being is that better yeah it is the more specific you are the more effective according to saint thomas which we find in this line of work who's absolutely the case in fact you actually spend a majority of your time during exorcisms trying to get the one specific piece of information you need to do to get him out, right? So, uh, and then it's usually like a very specific prayer. She's got to say this prayer, or you've got to do this particular thing, and then boom, it's out. So, yeah, it's being very specific. The other thing I'll often recommend is asking Our Lady of Sorrows, specific under that title, for the grace to see what's the nature of the demon that you're dealing with, because a lot of times the demon that you're dealing with, what you think you're dealing with, is not the not the real problem. So, for example, one family I have in mind, they had a gargantuan set of problems with the with areas of temperance. So they had homosexuality, they had fornication, they had gluttony, they had all sorts of problems in that area. So I just asked them, "Does your family have a problem with pride?" And they they said yes, and then. Once they started attacking that particular spirit of pride, all the other areas just cleared out for the most part. So, um, because what they'll do is they'll lob, they're tacticians, they'll lob bombs and get you distracted over here, just like our politicians do. They get you distracted over here rather than and when they're really over here causing the damage. Yeah. Now, when, you, when you're liberating someone, I mean, the first step is obviously discovery. You got to figure out 
is there a demon in here, right? That's yeah. stage one. What, what's, right. you know, if, w walk us through the, the different hurdles or the processes or stages, phases of liberation. Um, if you're talking about possession specifically, you mean, mm -hmm. or, yeah. Possession. So there's actually, there's actually six stages. The sixth stage is just liberation itself. The first stage is, um, what we call the discovery phase. Uh, I go into great detail in the priest side. I don't have it in the lay people side, but I have it in great detail. So is the discovery phase. And usually that's, it's, you're starting to think, you know, maybe this person's problem is spiritual. Sometimes there will be a preternatural manifestation, which someone will see. And we'll just like, okay, wait a minute. There's something here that we didn't see before. But you'll start, people start to notice patterns of behavior that don't seem to really line out. They seem almost nefarious or evil. And so they're like the wondering or the person themselves will say there's something wrong with me. They may not necessarily want to know what it is. So they'll go to a priest for help, etc. So and then usually in that discovery phase, you'll say a series of prayers that'll kind of drive the demon to the surface and at a certain point he'll actually show himself. The second phase, um, although usually once they preternaturally manifest in one of those three that we talked about earlier yeah, uh, in, in this podcast, <clears throat> um, then you've entered into stage three, which I'll mention here. In a but they also go, the second phase is what we call the obfuscation phase. That is where the demons are trying to confuse the person and, this, and the exorcist. Well, maybe she just needs more psychological help. Maybe she just needs another pill. Maybe she just needs to go see this other doctor. Maybe she, and maybe your problems are just psychological. You know, maybe if you just got this, things would be fine. You know, they're, so they're, they're obfuscating stuff and they're trying to hide. It's basically they're trying to hide because they don't want to be fully revealed. But once you realize, once they preternaturally manifest and you see them, they're like, okay, the gig's up, right? You know what they are. So then you enter into stage three, which is the battle phase. That's the one that constitutes the longest amount. That's the time in which the exorcist is going to have to be doing a lot of prayers in order to gain a certain amount of control and authority over the demon. There's usually a series of information that comes out, like how many possessors there are, what parts of the body they're possessing, what's go what's, uh, how did you get in, things of that sort start to come out. At that stage, it's your... You might even find out what's the sign of departure. That is, means when they leave, what are we going to see, right? So um, you might get that. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. You might get when they're going to leave. You might not. Usually when they tell you when they're going to leave, they're lying to you anyway. So you never ask that. Even though it's in the ritual, I read it, but I don't, I don't spend too much time on it. When you get towards the end of stage three, you're gaining so much control over the demon that he starts to lose control over the internal aspects of the possession, where he can't control things as much. The person, the person is starting to get psychological separation from the demon, and they're able to fight, combat this thing fairly effectively. When you start getting to age of stage three, you, you can. I've only had a few cases that actually go through stage four. Most skip from three to four. And stage four is what we call the external phase. This is the stuff that you saw in Emily Rose, where... You're doing the exorcisms, and he starts losing control, and so he starts literally moving stuff around in the buildings. Out, you know, you'll, all the stuff starts to start moving around. Books fall off, the lights blow out. Um, in one case, I had he would blow out the plumbing, and um, in fact, we actually had one case where he was a, it was Abaddon, who's a demon of a demon of destruction. Um, he would he every time we would have sessions, he would cause some type of major damage either to the building or something around the building. We, we literally. Um, one session, the train derailed the block away. Then the next session, right next was there was a, there was a highway, inflammable mattresses in a, in a semi burst into flames, right, and shut down the thing for eight hours. Then the next time it blew out the plumbing. The next time it, it melted down the hard drive in the pastor's computer. You know, so this this is they they moved externally when they start losing control over the internet, and it's all a distraction, and it's all trying to get you to. It's a bluff, trying to think, oh, he's more powerful than he actually is, and that's actually a sign of weakness that he's got to do that, right? Um, it's also a sign of frustration on their part because they're losing control. That, like I've said, though, I've only had that in a handful, maybe seven cases where you see stuff that's that pronounced. You'll still get a little bit of it, but it's that pronounced. Then usually at the end of stage three, people go into stage five. So the, the, the demon starts losing control over the dynamics of it. Then he enters into stage five. And stage five is what we call the ascendancy phase. This is where people start to climb out. That they, they start to leave a more normal life. They can even get to the point where their life is completely normal, except for during sessions. Um, it also is a, it's a sign that the demon has basically lost. There's different parts of that stage five, but you, you go up through that. And then you'll get right towards the end of stage five. Your goal is to get the last piece of information that's necessary in order to get him out. And it's usually right towards the end of stage five. He'll say, this is what has to be done. Then you do it. And then stage six is the person's liberated. So that's the overarching process. And that's 
on average, how long? I know you said it's changed over time, but yeah, I do. Yeah, it, it can. It can. It sh it just is really case specific. So sometimes people will skip large parts of stage three. They'll skip stage four. They'll go right from three to automatically to five, and so they just climb out very quickly. And they're so you can have cases that are not too common, but you can have cases that are two to three months. The average case now from the exorcist that I'm talking to, because of this event that may have happened in the church that we've talked about in the past, the average case now is about two to four years um, receiving exorcisms. Um, the longest case I've ever had is the one that's just wrapping up now, which is 14 years. So wow. it just it just depends on the dynamics of the case. The length of the possession is proportionate usually to two things. It's either uh, because God wants the person to obtain or the family or the exorcist to obtain something in the process, or it's connected to external factors, which is very rare. In other words, the... Um, you have to start kind of cleaning up. So I'll, I'll give you an example of the external factors. There was a nun who became possessed in the early in the uh, 1930s in Iowa. A nun, you she, say? A nun. And the exorcist got to the point where he was able to command the demon, you know, um, uh, what sin did he, he asked her, what sin did she commit? Because that's a mistake. People think that you have to commit a grave sin yourself to become possessed, which is not always the case. He says, what sin did she commit? And he, the demon just looked at her and said, she didn't commit any sin. Well, then how did you get in? He said, God let us in. Well, why did he let you in? Because he said, there's a sin in the region for which God wants reparation. It was the sin of divorce. Wow. And so he, um, they, the, the bishop, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the exorcist went to the bishop, reported it. They set up um, perpetual adoration around the diocese. And um, about 48 hours later, she was liberated. Wow. When the map reparation had been made. So sometimes you'll see stuff like that, but those are very rare. Okay. So it's, it's, it just runs the gamut. I've seen people, uh, especially children, usually, unless there's been satanic ritual abuse, children clear up really quickly. The um, I've seen cases, you know, just one or two minor prayers, and boom, he's out. It just depends on the dynamics. So people are asking, you know, in the chat, like, what about autism? What about... Uh post-traumatic syndrome what about this what about that do mental handicaps disabilities or injuries like post-traumatic syndrome do those make people more open to the demonic or not at all our ex consistent experience i have prayed over hordes and hordes of those kinds of people and our consistent experiences if there is an organic problem with the individual that is like autism or uh, what have you our experience is is that if there's any diabolic influence whatsoever it's purely ordinary it's never extraordinary in fact i have yet to come across a child that has those particular difficulties that suffers from extraordinary diabolic influence and i've talked to numerous exorcists and none of them and we've prayed over hordes of them and we never see much of a shift Usually when you start seeing like behavioral problems start to arise, there's usually some, there's some organic or there's some natural reason. You just got to parse it out and usually you'll, you'll clear that up pretty quickly. PTSD is a little bit of a different kind of an animal because um, demons can um, cause the internal factor psychologically to aggravate or actually cause the PTSD because they can be the cause, they can mimic or cause every psychological illness doesn't mean every psychological illness is. In fact, a majority of them are not caused by demons, but they can do that. And so um, there was one point where uh, I was a pastor in a particular location. Guys were coming back from uh, the uh, second Gulf War and they were all suffering the same symptomology. They weren't talking to each other. They didn't even know about it, but they were suffering the exact same symptomology, which today we would call PTSD. And so um, the fact that they were all so consistent, I thought, you know, so what I did is I started praying over them. I found out one or two minor exorcisms, and it would blow it out. And they would just, they just, I don't know what happened, but I just, I'm not dealing with it anymore. I'm not suggesting that everybody who goes to war or is going to get cleaned up that way. I'm just saying that um, what I, the conclusion I came to is, is because I was actually, what I was doing is, um, I would say the minor exorcisms, but then I would do stuff to break any curses because I thought, I wonder if these Afghans or, or, the, or the people in the Gulf were cursing these guys. And I found that when I just did that, it just cleaned it up. So mm. 
But PTSD is also an actual psychological condition that can be caused by environmental factors or certain psychological factors. So it can be a purely natural phenomenon too. Demons can make use of it. Um, but then again, it's one of those little demon, big dramas type of things where they just, the person already has this issue and then they just have to do a little bit of uh, aggravation to get the person to really react. So, um, but even those types of things can easily be discerned, um, you know, based upon the fa the various uh, factors and, and criteria, which I discuss in my book. Okay. And then another thing that I've heard you say is that predominantly those who are possessed uh, tend to be female. Can you speak to that? Well, statistically, we're not sure. Yeah. Statistically, we're not sure what the percentages actually are other than, and this is not true about every exorcist. It's true about most exorcists. Most exorcists, about 80% or more of the people that come to them are women. Um, there was one one exorcist I know that he says, no, I actually have more men. But I think it has to do with the demographics where he's living than it has to do with anything else. Um, so, But most it's women. And I, there's two factors that we have uh, observed in what we think is the cause of that. The first is, is that women are more victimizable. And so they're more likely to become subject to um, diabolic influence because they're victimized more often. They're also, possession among women is also very often more tied to their uh, victimization than it is their own particular sin. Whereas men, it tends to be the, kind of the other way around. It's not a oh. huge difference, but you see that. because Yeah, it's usually because some guy's been, he's been watching porn or something like that, and that's how, why he became it. Whereas with women, it's been, she was molested when she was seven or something like that, you know. And so that, and that's how the demon initially got in, and then he drove things, and or he just became, they became possessed at that age. Um, in fact, the last two cases I've had were women who were... Um, uh, basically evil things happen to them and then that's why they ended up becoming possessed although they become they're some of the most holy women I know now um, so there's that factor uh, part of it is also also be just because of the fact that Satan just hates women because they're in the image of Our Lady but and so he wants to victimize yeah, I mean he them. went after Eve first yeah yes exactly I mean that kind and of he wants to sets a pattern them. there doesn't it yeah exactly because he On hates the Our other Lady hand, Right. Does he hate? Thing, uh, sorry, to interrupt. Does he hate Mary or Jesus more? Uh, my own personal experience is, is that he hates her more, and not because he recognizes that um, Jesus is more loathsome in a sense, because he's more, he's better, he's good, he's infinite, and in his human divine nature, etc. It's not because of that. It's because of the fact. that that um, it hinges just a girl. Yeah, it, yeah, and it hinges, it hinges on the fact that he was going to be below her. Yeah. He can deal with the humanity of Christ, even though that is beneath him. But the fact that they have the hypostatic union that Christ was going to become incarnate, God was going to become incarnate. He can kind of tolerate that. Our Lady, that's another matter. So, um, but then the other the, the other factor that we find in women is, um, and I, I just tell people, it usually boils down to this: women will actually stop and ask for directions. <laughs> so, true guys will just like keep driving around and driving around, trying, rather than just say, "Look, I'm lost. I got to ask somebody." So, what we find is that women um, will very often like get to the point where they're just exasperated and they'll just like, "I need help," and so they'll go ask for help, whereas guys are less likely to ask for help. It's also, I think, with guys, the part of the, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why they're less likely to ask for help, but we think that's one of the primary reasons. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I imagine it just, it just Satan, the idea that just a human that's so, I mean, human, we humans are so below angelic species, oh, yeah. angelic minds. I mean, to them, we resemble like animals. We have nostrils yeah. and eyeballs yeah. and ears and hair and intestines yeah. we have everything that a pig has and yet right. we're, yeah. we somehow have this intellect and will that and god wants to <laughs> redeem us and we That's get multiple right. chances ain't fallen angels demons get one chance one chance yeah and we get but what's interesting is even after that one chance if you if you, you even ask him i've done this in session if you could change your mind would you do it no i mean how could it how could they say that if they're that smart um well you know what's interesting is I think that as human beings, we we tend to have an inverse understanding of voluntariness in this sense. We think that, 
oh, well, we would do it because we're weak or because there's some good, there's something that we're tempted towards or we're being pressured or something like that. And um, when, but the, um, and so we're likely to change our minds because of those things. Well, the reality is, is that in, in relationship to, and so they think, well, I don't understand why demons wouldn't have this choice to make, or they wouldn't want to choose something different having undergone this. Actually, the demons knew full well which I talk about in the book, they fully understood the full extent of their punishment and they knew what was going to happen. They knew what they were going to lose. They knew what they would suffer. They knew that they wouldn't get this thing anyway. They knew all of that. But the difference is, is because they weren't under pressure, they actually had grace in prompting them to choose the good. They had, they had full, complete knowledge meant that their choice of will was more, far more voluntary than ours. They fully chose evil in this respect i mean they choose it under the aspect of the good but they're choosing and that's why they're there that's why they'll say they'll even admit in session that their choice was pure unadulterated malice isn't that something yeah i mean to be mortal sin you have to have full knowledge full consent and an angel can has a much bigger mind than we do they do and the one thing that you have to remember is that with them because it's absolutely voluntary when their choice makes their cho that choice, their will becomes fixed permanently in that thing by their choice. Whereas human wow. beings, we're dumb, and so uh, we can kind of vacillate and move around. It's because of our ignorance, ultimately, that we get mercy and get cut some slack, and we can't fully determine ourselves, um, you know, in in, in one sense, and by what our wills in one choice. We can determine our eternal destiny that way, and then it becomes permanent. But our wills aren't strong enough, whereas theirs are. And when they make a choice, it's all in. That's what I tell people. Look, they're either all in or they're all out. There's no this. Well, I'm not so sure. There's none of that. Yeah. All right. Before we end, I know I can sense people watching in the chat and all that. They're like, whoa, this is real. This is serious. Uh, the demons do have influence or can try to influence us. What is your counsel? What are the daily norms for the Catholic? to prevent us from demonic influence. Yes, have holy water, but can you talk about prayers, Yeah, uh, sacramentals? I know this is all in the book as well, but just yeah. a daily plan from when you wake up and go to bed, how to protect if you're a dad, your wife and your kids, or just right. yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is, is that make sure you're leading a habitual life of grace. Never commit mortal sin. Always stay in the state of grace. Receive the sacraments on a regular basis. If you can get to daily mass, that's fantastic. That will provide a tremendous amount of protection. Getting to confession on a regular basis provides an enormous amount of protection. Okay, so that How being often, said, Father? Um, well, if you're leading a life of habitual grace, historically, they always said once a month. But if you're really trying to advance in holiness, you're probably going to want to go more frequently just so that you get those extra graces. As far as, um, you know, the particular prayers in the, in the morning, I usually tell people, you know, it's good to, you know, obviously you should make your morning offering. Part of that can actually be for your family's protection. One of the things that we recommend is the Auxiliary Christian Norm prayers, which you can get online. Um, because it protects you and your family. Parents, to do what you do, Taylor, which is that before you go to bed at night, you should be blessing your children and also saying a binding of prayer against any demons that could possibly afflict them. I don't think people realize how much that does, how how much freedom and how much you're providing your child in that regard when you're doing that. And we can do that from a distance um, too, right? Like if your children right. have moved out or whatever, you can still bind and, that's right. and bless your children from a distance. That's correct. And then the other thing is, is that you can, um, you know, obviously saying the rosary on a daily basis, Padre Pio referred to it as the weapon against Our Lady. Um, every day, you know, right, Father? Can, every day. Every day. Every day. And the, um, I mean, you can get the book, Deliverance Prayers for the Laity, um, reading more about it by buying my book. You can do that. Um, but I think it really, it's a matter of having that consistent prayer life. Oh, one of the things that we have found extraordinarily helpful to keep diabolic obsession at bay, but also St. Thomas says you cannot overcome imperfections um, without it. And also uh, all the saints say it's the uh, Teresa of Avila, the one who most enunciated it is, it's the entryway to all the higher levels of prayer is daily meditation. Mm. Doing 15 to 30 minutes of daily meditation will keep diabolic obsession 
at bay, and it makes you much more perceptive um, when you see things that are disordered or evil. Okay, so we got daily rosary. We have a daily meditation of at least 15 minutes. Uh, right. We have our, our binding prayers, avoiding right. mortal sin, daily mass if you can, confession every two to four weeks. Right. Excellent. That would be just a basic, a baseline that I would tell people. And then people. what if about doing... miraculous metal, scapular? Oh, yeah, using all the sacramentals like holy water, exercised oil. If you can get it, some dioceses won't allow the lay people to use it, which I don't understand why. They say, well, they're confusing it with um, the oils that are used for sacraments. I'm like, well, okay, that's a five-minute catechesis issue. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. You know? <laughs> right. uh, but then also all the other sacramentals, having religious already even talk about that, um, crucifixes, the like, having Benedict medals. Um, what about enthroning the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart oh, of Mary? Yeah, in the absolutely. absolutely. And dads I can do. do that, right? Yes, they can. And can, sing, can. can moms without a husband do that? Um, I think they can because of the fact that by proxy, or not by proxy, but by default, they're the head of the household at that time. There's no right. one else there that's going to do it because the husband has abandoned his headship. So, but if the husband's present, she should, uh, she should, it obviously has to be deferred to him. Yeah. 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 All these things. I mean, it's sad because since the 1960s, since Vatican II, a lot of these just standard devotions, it was kind of like you brush your teeth in the morning and at night yeah. and you wash your hands before dinner. I mean, like basic customs. Well, we Catholics had all these basic customs that were just part of our culture, like praying the Angelus and and wearing the brown scapula when you got your first communion and all these things. And it's kind of been lost and we're having to, so many of us, it's not your fault out there watching. It's not your fault that you don't know these things. It's just we have to relearn right. uh, what it means to be a Catholic. Yeah. I mean, the Catholic culture, all these things that were part right. of that rich culture have just been lost. Yeah, totally lost. So. You know, especially for moms and dads listening with the kids, the way you reveal culture is through generational teaching. And that's what kind of got exactly cut in the right. 60s and yeah. 70s. It was just just sliced right there. So we have to sort of rebuild that when it comes to the right. saints days, devotions, daily rosary, uh, scapular, right. miraculous medal, um, fasting, Friday fasting, penance, all these things. Right. So yeah, we just got to do it. We just... No, there's no one that's can do it for us. We have to educate and uh, and rebuild this Catholic culture. And thank yes, thank God we have Father Chad Ripperger and other good priests <laughs> who are saying these things, these consistent things that we have to live. And I, I really want that to be a challenge for you. You know, don't. I mean, I guess we do all want to be afraid that we would get possessed. That'd be horrible. But we can. Yeah, maybe. I think obviously Christ said, "Don't fear." You know. Basically, he says to only fear the one that can actually cast you into hell, which is God, ultimately. But yeah, you shouldn't have any fear in relationship to them. And if you're just if you're leading a good Catholic life, your odds, like as we've just as you've just described, we've just described, if you live that Catholic life in that fashion, your odds of becoming possessed are so astronomical, it's not even to even considered in a certain sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's some good advice. Uh, marching orders for everyone. Um, I would really encourage people to get your book, Deliverance Prayers. Mm -hmm. um, you can get that. Where do you, where would you prefer people to get that? Um, well, we, we started our own corporation and, and shipping in order to get away from Amazon because our goal is to eventually get completely away from Amazon. You can get it on Amazon. Yep. Um, the faux leather one is only available at our press, which is Centrad, S-E-N-T-R-A-D, press.com. Um, the Dominion book is available, which is for the lady, is available both on Amazon and at our press. Um, the Diabolic Influence for the clergy is available only at our press. So you have to you have to go there. Part of that is because we're controlling who gets it and who doesn't. Um, lay people can buy it for their pastor. They can order it, um, but it has to be uh, – the shipping address has to be a verifiable priest. Right. Yeah. So um, they can order it for their priest if they would like to order it. Good. Very good. All right, Father. Well, um, we already said it, but I always say pray the rosary every day. If you're not on the team. we got to pray that rosary every day, yeah. especially with our families. we got to pray that rosary. And, um, Father, will you uh, give us a blessing? And then we should pray something in Latin. What do you want to end with? Do you want to do a Hail Mary? or? Yeah, let's do a Hail Mary in Latin, and then we'll, okay. uh, I'll give you a blessing. Okay. 
All right. In nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus frutus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc editor mortis nostre. Amen. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, super vos, et manet semper. Amen. Amen. All right, Father, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, definitely... I, our family supports, and I would encourage you to support uh, Father Chad Ripperger's uh, work. And uh, the name of the website is? Uh, Dolorens, D-O-L-O-R-A-N-S dot org. Dolorens dot org. Dolorens dot org. Please visit there. Uh, thanks to everybody who supports this channel on patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. We are sending out signed copies of my new book, Antichrist in Apocalypse, which does cover a lot of the demonic in the apocalypse. Um, so if you want to do that, go to patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. Father Chad Ripperger, thanks so much for watching. And Thank you, Taylor. And everyone, remember our Lord Jesus Christ is you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. Father, thank you so much. We appreciate you. God bless.